Okay, so it's 4 p.m. Berlin time, 5 p.m. Minsk time. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second Zeus webinar. The topic of today's talk is COVID-19 in Belarus and the regional context. We have been uh, witnessing and seen a lot of uh, web talks, uh, webinars during the past weeks, uh, focusing on the topic of uh, or the impact of the coronavirus in our research region. Uh, just last week, Zeus uh, um, had a webinar on Central Asia and Corona. But somehow Belarus figured below the common radar uh, of these debates. And besides the odd quote of uh, President Lukashenko on the Corona uh, psychosis and uh, the remedy of uh, vodka and banya uh, to fight this disease, uh, we have not been, um, we have not seen a um, more deeper analysis of the special paths or the Sonderweg that the country is currently embarking on. Therefore, we have two speakers with us today, Olga Drindova and Andri Eliseu, who will illuminate the situation in Belarus for us. And it's good to have you with your collective expertise um, with us today. Uh, we're very th thankful for that. And um, I would start with presenting Andre. He is a Belarus-based legal and social scholar who holds degrees from Belarusian and Baltic universities. Currently, he is the research director of the East Center, based in Warsaw. And that's a think tank that focuses on East European and post-Soviet affairs. Olga is uh, the editor-in-chief of the Belarus Analysen, an information out outlet published by the research Center for East European Studies at the University of Bremen. She holds a Diploma of International Relations and a Master's Degree of Intercultural Communication from universities in Belarus and Germany. And she is also active in the Belarusian-German cooperation. So as you can see, the webinar today is a little different from what you might be used to in the Zoom format, for example. Um, we have only five persons in the room today um, the rest is joining us um, via live stream, and therefore also um, the discussion later on will be conducted a little bit different. And um, so I will now refer to my colleague, uh, Stefanie Orfal, who is uh, our uh, director of the Zeus communications team, and she will give you some technical explanations concerning the live stream and the possibility of uh, asking questions later on. Hello, welcome uh, from my side as well. Um, I'll be assisting Nadia today um, during this uh, webinar. Just a few technical uh, details. In case the live stream is interrupted, please just refresh your web browser. You know how to do that either by pressing F5 or by um, using the, the icon in the web browser on the left-hand side usually of your browser's address bar. Then it usually comes up back again. Um, in the second part of this, um, meeting or webinar, you can participate in the discussion by submitting questions or brief comments um, in the chat, via the chat, uh, chat function. How do you find that? It's a purple button just below the, um, the screen, of just below the stream. Um, and you just click on Start Text Chat in New Window. Then the new window will open. And please enter your name and maybe the city um, as the chat starts. And I will collect your questions and also brief remarks. Keep them brief. I will have to repeat them to the speakers, and the speakers will answer them in the second part of the um, webinar. So we've been looking at the statistics, the latest statistics. Uh, the curve of COVID-19 infections in Belarus is showing a steep upwards trend, maybe a little less. Uh, last two days, but um, despite the recommendations of the WHO for Belarus, which were published yesterday, um, so far we cannot see that the Belarusian leadership uh, has uh, started to tighten the anti-crisis measures or has become more uh, reactive. So officially, Belarus has opted for a strategy of mitigation to fight the pandemic as opposed to the strategy of containment, Stergivania, adhered to by other countries in the region, and also obviously Western Europe. Um, according to the Belarusian health minister, the advantage of mitigation is that it limits the 
it supposedly limits the spread of the disease at a lower socioeconomic cost. So I will start with Olga. Um, can you tell us more about the motives of President Lukashenko and Health Minister Karanik to opt for this pass? Are we talking here about a coherent strategy? And can we at all also compare the situation in Belarus to Sweden as the Belarusian leadership uh, repeatedly uh, stressed in, in public statements? Ah, I think it's, ah. right now, I think we have a problem with this. Uh, now we can hear you. Very good. So thank you once again for the question. Um, I prepared just a couple of uh, files for our guests um, uh, to, to have a general impression of what actually happens in the region. So you can see it with these uh, nice bright colors. And that would be in the background of, of, of my um, uh, presentation now. So um, just to give you um, um, uh, some figures before I come to strategy. Uh, for today, we have uh, 7,289 cases, confirmed cases of COVID in Belarus and uh, 58 um, death cases. So you can see uh, um, here the uh, numbers of overall um, COVID cases uh, in this uh, map and uh, this is um, um, the number of cases per million of people. So it's more or less um, uh, in the same uh, group when we compare it to the um, um, states in the region. And that's how it looks like. I'm sorry for that, that it's in, um, in Russia, but you, you, you can see still see uh, uh, how the curve is developing. Um, and this is more or less uh, how it looks within Belarus. So we have Minsk region and Vitebsk region. It's on the north, uh, which are most uh, uh, affected by the um, uh, COVID cases in Belarus. And this is actually the confirmed death. So it's more or less the same in the region. But if you look on the uh, dearest per million people, uh, you can already see that Belarus is um, uh, well has more deaths. So it's darker with the colors than, for example, Ukraine and Russia. And if you have, um, if you look at the next slide, it is actually also a very important, um, um, uh, a very important uh, figure, which I think Andrei will elaborate more. Um, um, after me, uh, just just have a look that the death rate actually will, uh, the number of people who actually died uh, out of the number of people who were confirmed, um, um, it's. Uh, extremely low, so it's under one percent, and it is a bit the same in Russia. And we see that it's higher. Uh, you can see these colors. It's higher in the regional state, where um, in other states in the re in the region, where you, um, we actually know that quarantine and and uh, very hard measures have been introduced. So it's a very uh, strange uh, um, tendency. But uh, I think Andre will. Um, tell us more about that. So coming back, um, Nadia, to a question, what happens in Belarus and which strategies we have and how does it come together? Um, I would say for the very beginning that we don't really know um, who was the first to decide on the strategy. So, and whether the president was actually informed adequately about the new nature of the virus, we don't know that. We don't know it, if it was his decision, so to say, and then it was overtaken by the Minister of Health, or maybe it was the decision or a hint from the Minister of Health that the Belarusian system of health will manage this crisis, and that's why we heard what we heard from the president. So you can speculate on that. I also talked to some experts. There, There is a, um, an opinion that Karanik, the Minister of Health, could have been for the quarantine at the very beginning, but we don't really know that. And I would describe the strategy today is a kind of adhering to the president's main message, which is still no panic. Panic is uh, dangerous for society and for economy, but at the same time trying to minimize the humanitarian consequences of the virus spreading. So the Minister of Health is somehow between these uh, two um, important uh, factors and trying to handle within that. So let us uh, let us look at what actually happens on the side of the president, and then I'll compare his um, messages to um, some measures that we see from the Minister of Health. So as I think most of you already know, 
Uh, the main message of the president has have president have been um, till now that the virus is not dangerous. The panic is worse and more dangerous than the virus. Uh, but somebody, um, somebody in the world would need it, uh, this fight the pandemic to um, to achieve some uh, economic or political aims, some watch powers. Self-isolation and personal hygienic measures, hygiene measures are actually enough to handle the epidem epidemic. And economic consequences are much more dangerous than the death from the virus itself. Then we have some cases of victim blaming, uh, which I will elaborate on later. Um, and parenting will divide society. It's also an interesting argument. Um, he argues that people who would stay at home and people who would stay um, working at factories because they cannot do home office would, so to say, uh, <laughs> not be happy because it's not fair. And nobody will die from Corona. It's uh, one of the latest statements of the president, uh, which means that people who who actually die from Corona already have some chronic disease. So it doesn't really matter because they, their health has already been damaged. So it's more or less uh, one of the latest uh, statements of the president. Um, if we think about the possible reasons, I mean, we also speculate on that because we cannot, we cannot uh, know for sure but um, more or less, it seems like economic reasons seem to be a very important in these decisions because we know that Belarus entered the year 2020 already in a very bad economic condition and the experts actually prognosed um, economic recession. And then we have these conflicts, uh, oil conflicts with Russia. Um, for now on, um, experts um, talk about uh, up to 10% decrease in the growth of the product and huge numbers of possible unemployment uh, up to, I, I don't remember exactly, I think it's between one and one and a half million people. So uh, in some sense, uh, he, he is right because he understands that huge unemployment will damage the whole economic system and people might be more angry if they lose uh, their job than if they see that somebody dies from virus. It is also possible, but it's also it's also very interconnected with the political reasons because we have uh, um, presidential elections planned for this year, and uh, of course, people are who lost their jobs. It's, it's not very good social and economic base for the elections, and the elections actually should happen according to the Belarusian. Um, low up to to the end of August this year. But I would also um, not deny completely uh, the psychological uh, group of the reasons because um, well, these, um, these so-called conspiration theories that somebody needs something in the world. I mean, we already heard it also before, also during the, the, the wave of the swine flus and, um, and also in some other cases. Um, where president uh, interpreted, uh, well, told us his reason um, about his um, vision of um, uh, international relations. So we don't know if he really believes that, that or he, he might just use it uh, for, so to say, populist reasons to calm down the situation or to cause the panic. And we actually see that uh, he, he, he could also have been kind of a fatalist himself because, I mean, he has been playing hockey till now. He's traveling throughout the country. He's shaking people's hands. And according to the press secretary of the president, actually, he even prohibited any um, uh, security epidemiological measures in his residence. So it doesn't seem that he is uh, pretending because he uh, himself actually, well, theoretically, also belonging to the risk group of this disease does not seem to, to, to take much care of that. And um, the last one I would mention is also political. I think it's also he might be trying to avoid the very high political responsibility for taking these important decisions and taking all the responsibility of um, how the virus could develop because um, um, the virus is something you cannot really control. You can control some economic and political um, developments and uh, he has learned to do that in so many years in power but um, virus epidemic is something that is very unpredictable so we also can see here a tendency of um putin um uh, putin um 
responsibility in other ministries and even in some cases on local authorities. And I'll come to that in the second part of the, um, uh, of the conversation. Um, and now if you, if you look uh, at what is the Minister of Health is doing, so the main message is the same. We don't, know, we don't need panic. Everything is under control. Belarus has enough equipment and medical staff is protected. And what is very important here is this main message. We don't, uh, we don't hide anything from people. We don't hide anything from public. And we have heard it quite a lot of times from the ministry, even from the president himself. So this, this kind of level of distrust comes from society. You can already hear it because uh, a lot of state structures repeat, repeat it almost every week. People who don't have hide information from you. Um, Nadia, how many minutes do I have left? Okay, maybe we make a um, point here. And um, thank you, Olga, for now. We can elaborate this in the second round of questions. Uh, and now coming to Andre, um, you, uh, in a recent report, you outlined several scenarios for the further development of COVID-19 in Belarus. And you based your figures on a study by the Imperial College London. So according uh, to you and uh, these figures, where do we stand now? Which measures have been taken in the meanwhile? And how would your prognosis of the epidemiological uh, situation look like at the moment? Right. Uh, thank you, Nadia. Uh, indeed, about uh, three weeks ago, I released a policy brief where I critically analyzed the, the strategy of uh, fighting the epidemic in Belarus, uh, gave uh, the uh, projections of the uh, potential impacts of the epidemic uh, uh, may uh, cause to Belarus uh, um, produced in the study by the Imperial College London and uh, uh, drew uh, pessimistic and optimistic scenarios for uh, the uh, development of uh, epidemiological situation in Belarus. Uh, so uh, when it comes to the Imperial uh, College London study, uh, the uh, team of uh, scientists um, produced uh, potential scenarios for the impact the epidemic, epidemic uh, would cause uh, globally and to various countries, including Belarus. So uh, in their mathematic model, they uh, took into account uh, demographic, uh, um, social uh, pattern, uh, uh, social contact patterns in, in different countries, uh, hospital bed capacity and intensive uh, care units capacity, household size and other parameters. They also looked at uh, what different uh, possible uh, reproduction rates and uh, uh, state measures uh, to the epidemic uh, and uh, you know modeled what uh, the numbers of uh, hospitalized people, uh, people in the intensive care units and uh, a probable number of deaths uh, uh, could be uh, in for each of these scenarios. Uh, so uh, let me show you the uh, graph uh, which uh, summarizes uh, these uh, potential scenarios for Belarus. Uh, here we, uh, we can see what uh, number of deaths was projected uh, for Belarus uh, in different scenarios. Uh, for, uh, you know, the, the upper row are mitigated means no action uh, taken whatsoever. So it means that uh, if Belarus uh, did not take any measure, measure uh, whatsoever, the uh, number of deaths uh, caused by epidemic uh, may exceed uh, 60,000 people. We can see that if, uh, if the Belarus authorities uh, implement a mitigation strategy, meaning the reduction of uh, social contact rates to around 30, 50 percent uh, different uh, sub-scenarios and different scenarios if uh, in, uh, enhanced uh, social distance, distancing will be implemented for, uh, in, implemented for elderly people, then the, uh, um, the number, numbers of deaths are projected at about between 15 to 30,000 people. Uh, finally, when it comes to suppression strategy, uh, meaning a wider set of um, countermeasures and the reduction of social contact rate uh, at 75%, we can see that the a probable number of deaths uh, is where it's uh, depending on at what uh, points uh, um, in time these suppression measures are um, realized. So if if they are implemented at, uh, at uh, the moment in time when the number of deaths 
uh, COVID-related deaths in Belarus is below uh, 20 people uh, per week, then the number of deaths is projected to be less than 2,000 people. And as you can see, if, if this strategy is uh, applied at uh, a much later stage when the number of deaths uh, in Belarus would be around 150 pe people per week, then uh, the uh, projected number of deaths uh, is around 14,000 people. So as you can see, uh, you know, uh, the um, the main conclusion of the study, and it applies to Belarus and all other countries and, ter and territories, is uh, the wider set of measures uh, at the, and the earlier uh, moment of time they are implemented, uh, the uh, less uh, number of deaths uh, projected uh, caused by the epidemic. Uh, so uh, when it comes to where we stand now, uh, well, as, as far as you know, in, in the last uh, two or three weeks, uh, uh, a few you know, additional measures were taken uh, mostly by regional authorities, not national ones, uh, which um, um, must have uh, reduced uh, social contact rates in, in the country, but still clearly uh, Belarus is nowhere, uh, nowhere, nowhere near the suppression strategy. It's uh, it's uh, mitigation in the light scenario, I would say. Uh, so, um, as as you can see, uh, you know, judging from these projections uh, by these uh, international team of scientists, uh, this uh, may result in a, a very high death. Uh, uh, tall uh, for Belarus, uh, meaning that uh, the uh, authorities uh, should um, uh, introduce a much wider set of measures as recommended by the uh, WHO. Um, mm -hmm. On the contrary, what we see now, uh, the uh, Bill uh, uh, um, opposes a number of social uh, distancing measures. Like uh, the other day, he, for instance, lashed out at local administrations who demanded wearing medical masks uh, for uh, school pupils, or uh, he opposes uh, the um, um, interruption of church services uh, and uh, the military parade for the Victory Day is uh, still planned. So we can see that there's still a number of measures uh, which would not harm the national economy, but still are very important uh, in um, for uh, minimizing uh, the uh, social context and this, uh, and therefore. Um, slowing down, down the uh, development of ep epidemic. And of course, I failed to mention the uh, distance, in, uh, uh, distance uh, learning mode for schools. Um, the last week, uh, Lukashenko suddenly interrupted the prolongation of uh, school vacation. Uh, so uh, starting this, uh, this Monday, uh, people are back to school, not all of them, of course, because most of uh, parents prevent them from, from going to school. But still, we can see that the uh, state policies are not uh, systematic or very belated when it comes to introducing um, any uh, social distances measures in, in the country. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, yet in, in comparison with other countries in the region, can say that the health system in Belarus is not in such a bad shape. Um, and despite everything we also saw on the map uh, Olga showed us uh, before, that uh, also according to independent sources, that the situation, for example, in Vitsepsk uh, sort of got out of control a few weeks ago. Um, also what we witnessed the um, past few days is that the health ministry only irregularly um, gives press statements or informs about the COVID-19 situation in the country. So uh, for three days, there was no press statement at all. Um, Andre, what does this tell us about the information policy uh, by the government? Is it any different from uh, neighboring countries? Uh, yes, surely state media um, is approaching the epidemic threats uh, in uh, uh, in, a, in a very uh, dangerously oblique fashion, uh, in contrast to the uh, to the way that uh, media in neighboring countries uh, have adopted. Uh, so, um, as as you can imagine, the 
and those uh, measures uh, promoted by the Belarusian rulers, such as uh, work in the field or uh, steaming in sound and so on, they were well uh, transmitted by by the uh, state uh, TV division. But uh, in addition to these official, uh, this uh, um, odd official statements, the uh, the way uh, TV hosts and presenters um, cover the epidemic. Um, is uh, damaging and harmful for the public health, I would say, because uh, they uh, continuously downplay the threat posed by the epidemic. They ridicule the epidemic. Like, for instance, uh, one journalist reports in one of the state's uh, TV channels um, uh, was from the national football match game, and uh, the reporter uh, was, was saying that uh, this uh, was our... Uh, uh, this was our... Um, response uh, to to the pandemic, right? Uh, so um, uh, we can, we can see that the state's uh, television uh, channels uh, use a variety of manipulations uh, and techniques in order to downplay the threat instead of uh, informing the uh, population properly and the uh, vulnerable groups of population in the first place about the risks posed, uh, they, uh, um, they continuously um, highlight um, um, useless panic, infodemic, and uh, psychosis around the, um, the coronavirus uh, um, pandemic. So, um, of course, not uh, people in the country uh, um, follow the state media, but uh, uh, we can see from you know, earlier sociological surveys that uh, um, I suppose around a third of population have the state's uh, TV channels as the main source of information. So, uh, of course, this uh, impacts uh, you know, the view of a considerable part of population concerning the pandemic. And uh, one of the journalist reports by the uh, Radio Liberty is a, is a telling example as uh, journalists went to a small town of Dokshitsi in the Vitebsk region, uh, which is uh, 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 which is in, uh, in the epicenter of the uh, epidemic. And, and uh, local people were, um, you know, uh, telling journalists that they didn't uh, take it seriously, like in in March when people started to to cough and so on, that where they were just joking that maybe this uh, coronavirus epidemic uh, came uh, until until the time um, uh, higher numbers of uh, their you know um, acquaintances or relatives were hospitalized. People didn't uh, take it seriously. So we can see that, especially in, you know in, in small towns in, in rural areas, I believe when people uh, follow state. TV people do do not or uh, did not take it seriously until some points uh, in time. So uh, I believe that uh, the uh, state uh, state pol information policy is um, um, is not um, uh, responsible is not uh, um, responsible uh, is not uh, addressing the, um, the the threats posed by the epidemic uh, in a a nearly proper way. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Andre. Um, let's focus another moment on the reactions uh, in society. Olga, in your latest contribution for the Belarus Analysen, you wrote about the uh, perception of various groups in society of the government policies, the state um, policies. Um, can you elaborate on that? Yes, with great pleasure. Just if you give me maybe some t two minutes to um, to give you some examples of what actually happening from the side of the ministry, and uh, I also agree with um, Andre that we have um, that we are dealing here actually with incoherent information policy. I agree with it. Uh, just to give you some examples so that you understand why people react like they react, and then I'll come to the um, uh, reaction come from society. So. Um, the first example is on the 18th of February, the Ministry of Health of Belarus puts COVID-19 on the list of diseases which are dangerous for population, um, together with Ebola, syphilis, and tuberculosis. So it happened at the end of February. And at the middle of March, we hear the following statements by the president. We always have this disease in spring. This time, it's just more or less the same. 
And earlier we had more complicated diseases like swine flu and atypical pneumonia. So you can you can find more examples on that. Uh, for those of you who understand German, there is a chronicle for COVID in, in the Belarusian illusion, and we will also do it uh, in our next editions. But um, when you see this, you ask yourself, okay, was the president not informed about that, or he was informed, but he still tried to calm down the public. But then, of course, it would mean some kind of disinformation. And the second um, example, uh, 16th of March, the president um, says uh, that, um, well, we have too many masks in Belarus. Uh, we should export them to Germany, where they are needed more. And just on the very second day, from the 17th of March, sent, uh, certain medical products, including masks, are not allowed for export. I, well, it's the same question. It doesn't come together. So, of course, people who more or less uh, follow the, the news and uh, try to understand what happens on the level of the president and what, what has been actually done on the level um, of the ministry, uh, these are uh, very often two different strategies. Um, and uh, um, we should also, I just wanted to show you this map, um, we should also take into consideration that uh, the, at the first phase, actually the uh, World Health Organization was supporting the measures taken um, by the by Belarusian authorities. So there was this uh, strategy of targeted isolation of uh, positives, of COVID positives on the context of the first grade. So actually every people, well, all people who were infected, who were positives, were taken to the hospitals and isolated for two weeks. It didn't happen, in, for example, in other states. Um, so there was some kind of um, more or less coherent strategy at the beginning. Um, and uh, well, people at the airports, they were checked temperatures and so on and so forth. So um, there are quite a lot of measures. and. The Minister of Health was actually sure that that would work. I mean, you can see uh, the, the number of doctors per 1,000 people. You can see here that Belarus is quite dark blue, so that means that it uh, um, has a very good position. And the next file, it's even better. Uh, OK, it's yet 2013, but still, um, um, you can see that it's the only country in Europe uh, with this number of um, uh, hospital beds for 1,000 people. So the Minister of Health, of course, they had this information and they were more or less sure that that will, would work in Belarus. And we also have to admit that Belarus has inherited from the uh, Soviet Union uh, the system of infection hospitals throughout the countries with uh, trained Staff, and that's actually what they have been doing till now. They have been tracking uh, people and trying to find out their contacts and isolated um, them in the hospitals. But since uh, since at latest the 10th of April, April, um, after the uh, World Health Organization delegation visited Belarus, they admitted that now we have to deal with community transmission phase. So the cases are already uh, trans transmitted within the country. And there we have the problem that Andre already mentioned that sports events, religious events, cultural events are not really be being abolished. They are not, um, uh, they're, they, some of them still take place. We have football matches that still for championships uh, that still take place. Churches were opened at Easter and uh, uh, military parade uh, should take place. I mean, even Russia abolished it, but in Belarus, it's still there are still preparations for that on the 9th of May. And even protests take place in Brest, which I find very, very interesting for the case of Belarus because, I mean, well, um, you could have, uh, one could have abolished it, uh, taking into consideration that it's an authoritarian state by that. 300 people protest um, and protested and rest against um, uh, and what do you call it? Sorry, I'm going to interrupt. Maybe just a little precision. Um, we also saw a very um, uh, radical reaction by the uh, so called opposition. Um, well, if there's a coherent opposition or not, that's another question. Uh, but uh, is that representative for the general population or what would you say? Because you also differentiated between various uh, types of civil society in Belarus in your contribution. Mm -hmm. 
I would not name it even a position. I think it would um, look like active part of uh, active part of society, mm -hmm. like people who are activists, so people who use social networks, who have contacts abroad, who are more or less liberal, pro democratic, also uh, crowdfunding platforms, business. And the second group would be a uh, general and broader public. And here we have two um, quite different groups, I would say, um, and we can combine them. Well, the first group uh, reacts quite uh, hard on the statements of the president. So we have Telegram channels and media ask, uh, asking state to improve the state po information policy. We also have um, a, a number of petitions, for example, over 150,000 people signed the state petition for current when introducing quarantine in people and over 7,000 people signed the petition against the parrot on the 9th of May. So we have students, we have uh, actually what is also very interesting that independent media, media seek uh, for doctors uh, who are ready anonymously uh, to explain what is, uh, what is actually happening in the hospitals because People tend not to believe the official numbers. Uh, you see, uh, you saw this, uh, all these death rates in Belarus, they're extremely low, and um, the society doesn't understand uh, what lies behind that. So the reasons for that, I would say, it's the general distrust to state and personally to the president in Belarus, of course, also comparison with the uh, uh, neighbors, uh, neighboring countries, and the um, inconsistency in information policy of the ministry, which has already been mentioned, but also alternative information and the medical staff, because there are a lot of um, there are a lot of reports uh, from doctors. They are afraid to uh, name the names, but they are um, communicating with the volunteers. They are communicating with media, and um, well, the picture that they give us is not necessarily the picture that we uh, uh, see if through the state media. Uh, what is actually uh, also what for me even the, uh, very surprising is a huge um, rise of voluntary activities uh, in Belarus. One of the most popular campaign is called um, uh, by COVID-19. So there mm -hmm. are just normal people who actually uh, overtook the functions of the state. So yes. people call, call in the hospitals and ask uh, doctors what do they need, what equipment, maybe they need gloves, maybe they need something else. And they actually uh, organize fundraising for that and they're very successful. And they trail throughout the country and uh, bring, so to say, this equipment to the doctors, to the hospitals, because the state has not managed to, um, to, to, to reach everybody to... Um, give everybody the safety um, items and so on. So we are talking about more or less the kind of a folk quarantine here and self-organization of people. But it's only the active part of society. If you give me one more minute, I will tell you um, what the broader public could think of that. Because, I mean, there is no sociological data. And those will know that uh, the Independent Sociological Institute was closed 2016. But still, um, one company, Satyo, uh, made a... Uh, an online research in March, and according to that, 70% of all public events should be abolished. Um, people say that they should be abolished. So people do not really believe in this official message. Um, the question of quarantine has actually split society. It's uh, more or less 50-50, and about 60% of people are actually afraid that the overload of the system, um, that the system, the state system, health system will be overloaded. And in spite of all these nice figures, I mean, you have seen that once again. So Belarus is number one here on the bad hospital per capita, but people somehow still don't have this trust. And I think we can talk about splitting the society. So for those who support the official line, who uh, take this message, no panic, uh, who laugh at those who wear masks or have maybe just want to believe that Belarus is special and will not suffer like Italy or other states, and those who don't. But what is also very important is that um, we have to deal with paternalistic political culture in Belarus, but at the same time, people kind of manage to sort of self organize themselves. In spite of the fact that they have contradiction, contradictory information within the state, I mean, here, president, ministry, and independent sources or state independent sources, but also, as Andrei mentioned, Belarusian and, and Russian media. Of course, a lot of people are targeted by the Russian media and 
if we see Russian President Putin wear this yellow uh, costume, anti Putin costume, and President Lukashenko uh, talking about playing ice hockey, I think even classical electorate of, of the president who does question, well, who is right between those two presidents, right? So um, just to summarize it, the main aim of the president, I think, is not to cause panic, actually have caused panic because of this interference information policy. And because people now have the, um, have the feeling that the state uh, does not function well during the crisis. So I think the president should have shown some more empathy to people, not to make them guilty because they hope that well people have died because they didn't self regulate themselves or they didn't uh, lead healthy um, healthy style of life people do not really understand why he says that i think he he could shown would have shown more empathy to people to listen or make them more engagement in fighting the epidemic but it's also difficult for him now to make a step back because his first reaction was so straight and was so automatic. Um, I mean, he has repeated many times, I will never change my mind. It's, it's my process and that's my reason and that's my um, opinion. So he cannot lose his faith and to make this step back. So I think it's one of the main reasons why he allowed local authorities in some cities the situation is really hard to take decisions. Okay, thank you, Olga. Uh, it's very interesting point you made about the proactive civil society, and these are really bright spots in this crisis. We can see uh, similar examples from country from countries in the region, Armenia or Georgia, where civil society has become proactive, to sort of compensating uh, where the state uh, failed partly. Um, so we have not so much time left but uh, just a final question um because both of you have also mentioned uh, the economic consequences or social economic consequences of the crisis for belarus um and i would like to ask a final question to andre what scenarios would you draw up uh, for the belarusian economy in case um the government uh, doesn't take up any more proactive measures in the coming weeks and months um, uh, leading uh, economic experts uh, uh, projects uh, mm, that uh, the uh, national GDP would drop uh, at least that's around 4% in the most optimistic scenario. So uh, anyway, uh, you know, uh, this uh, regarding the um, epidemiological situation or something, this uh, uh, this overall economic context uh, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, decrease in demand for some uh, categories of Belarusian goods would uh, provoke uh, economic uh, downturn. Uh, this, uh, in, in pessimistic scenarios, uh, it may result in a GDP drop up to 18 uh, percent. But of course, if the if the state uh, uh, actions uh, would not, uh, if they did not become uh, pro proactive, if if the ep ep epidemiological situation uh, um, uh, further aggravates then uh, we, of course, can expect uh, even uh, worse uh, uh, socioeconomic consequences because uh, if the uh, epidemiological situation uh, remains grave in Belarus for uh, some long period of time, we can expect that uh, uh, the EU, Russia and other countries would indefinitely prolong the ban uh, of entry to their territories uh, for Belarus citizens, uh, which would uh, uh, make a further blow to you know business contacts and uh, labor migration flows um, furthermore um, if if uh, the epidemiological situation goes out of control we can expect uh, uh, um, increased uh, um, tension of the financial system and uh, uh, further the legitimization of Lukashenko um, among the population in general and uh, the ruling class. Uh, finally, finally, if the Kremlin happens to manage the epidemic uh, in a, a much uh, uh, efficient way, 
uh, the you know more voices uh, we can hear more voices uh, for some form of humanitarian assistance uh, to Belarus with some unclear consequences for the country's sovereignty and so on. So uh, all in all, to sum up, if the epidemiological situation goes out of control, we can expect uh, uh, even. Uh, more, you know, aggravated socioeconomic situation, very uncertain domestic political situation, and even risks uh, to the country's sovereignty. Yes, and in case uh, Belarus hits a severe economic recession, what kind of implications or far-reaching implications could that have for the social peace in the country, Olga? Hmm. Well, I would make it... Uh... I would make it dependent uh, on the um, on the um, dynamic, on the epidemiological dynamic, uh, because uh, well, I, I think there are two different situations that we could have. Uh, in the first case, it would be uh, well, okay, not that m many people uh, will uh, die. Uh, from the uh, virus, but still, still have bad economy. And uh, the second scenario could be that uh, both of these factors come together. So there is a human humanitarian catastrophe, and uh, and, and once again a bad economy. And, and I think it will depend on what scenario we will have. But before I come to that, what I think to these open questions, I just want to give you some uh, four tendencies that we have seen so far. So what what the epidemic has shown to us, what is happening in the country. So first of all, and I already mentioned it, it's a uh, distrust to state and personally to the president, which has started and uh, well, I mean, started with the state institutions when they did not have that high level of trust also, also before the crisis and before the pandemic. But right now uh, we uh, were talking about the decline of that. Then um, the second point is kind of broken feedback mechanisms, which um, I mean, society and state structures. Well, the, when the majority are still waiting for um, where long, waiting uh, for a signal coming from above, which uh, of course is dangerous uh, for the local communities because uh, you know, when this main message "we don't need panic" comes from the very um, high level to, to single doctors, and we know also from human rights defenders that these doctors sign something like, um, how would you call that, well, sign a paper according to which they cannot uh, give information about COVID. So um, if it causes the, 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 the reaction that people do not tell their, their colleagues and the heads of the hospitals are the real numbers, then actually we don't know if, if the Minister of Health and also personally the President have uh, real numbers because they might be some kind of self center also within the hospitals. But at the same time, we have seen also some positive examples um, like uh, uh, this desire from um, active part of society for better information policy. For example, we now see a new state uh, website about COVID, it's Stop COVID. And for example, vacations in schools, they were prolonged two times for one week because the parents were excited. So it, it, it could function also the other way. And the last point is, um, well, inability of the system to react fast. We have seen that, but once again, it, it gives also the, um, the possibilities for local governments to act because local governments uh, situation in their region they, they see the reaction and panic of people and they started to react actually and also certain ministries started to react without some kind of sign uh well i think well, some kind of sign coming from the president so it could have been maybe the first step of the first step go in direction maybe not go in direction but think in direction decentralization uh, in Belarus in the future, and of course a huge rise of solidarity and volunteering. But for me, is um, for me, I have two big questions: what to do with that? Because I mean, we don't have that. Um, there is not much time left uh, in Belarus to election elections, and we do not know if this solidarity wave, this wave of volunteering, and this wave of distrust to the president really um, remains before the elections. It will depend on uh, whether which scenario we will have. So I think if there are not many deaths, a bad economy, president, uh, president 
would be a kind of a person who has saved people's lives and then it, that would be uh, more or less good for his uh, election campaign and the economic crisis would be explained by the overall economic decline in the world i don't know um, if people believe that or not but it's possible and the second scenario is bad uh, well bad economy with that with a lot of deaths uh, in belarus and this, I think, is unpredictable scenario because it could initiate social protests, economic protests, uh, like the uh, like the ones we saw in 2017, where people just don't have jobs, they don't have anything to eat. Hard repressions, of course, possible. Also, deterioration of relations with the West because of repressions. And as um, Andrea already mentioned, well, in the very worst case, and. Um, um, I don't know in how far realistic it is, but there is also a circle of experts in Belarus who believe also in this scenario is possible Russian intervention um, due to humanitarian and economic uh, crisis in Belarus, so to say, save people. So, uh, and what will happen with the solidarity wave? I don't really know because I don't believe that their position, because it's weak, I don't believe that they would be able to use it for the advantage. But it might it might be used maybe after elections by the civil society. Maybe maybe some leaders could come out of the civil society depending on how uh, the uh, epidemic um, uh, the epidemic and on what, what happens with the dynamic. Uh, with the okay, dynamic. I think there, there might be some questions from the audience uh, for that point as well. Um, Thank you, Olga. So far, thank you, Andre. We will now open the virtual floor for questions from the audience. And I think there have been already a couple of questions. Stephanie will read them out to us, telling us also from who and where they come. Yeah. Well, there have been uh, a couple of questions now in the chat. And I think some were from the very beginning who were um, more general ones. I think they might have been answered already. So I go to the specific questions who might have not have been um, uh, addressed yet. Um, Jonathan asked, what are your expectations for the presidential election taking place this summer? Will it be postponed? So this goes to all of you, I guess. Uh, I do not rule out uh, that the election uh, um, uh, would be postponed. Now, despite uh, Lukashenko's uh, Mm, a recent statement that uh, he's not going to do so. Uh, we do not know how the uh, situation um, development uh, be with the epidemic. So if it's uh, if it's really aggravates in the coming weeks and months, then uh, of course uh, the transfer of the presidential election and some uh, and some, uh, the emergency situation. Uh, can can be the case. I, I do not uh, allow this. I, I can see that uh, the uh, uh, Belarusian authorities and uh, Lukashenko uh, has been very optimistic about uh, the uh, potential scenarios uh, that the epidemic uh, may cause. Uh, that's why uh, he or they you know, didn't uh, seriously uh, take into account the transfer of the presidential elections, but I think that the postponement uh, is still very possible in case the situation is uh, aggravated. Do you want to add something or just go to the next one? No, I agree. And I, I only see the possibility of postponing the, the, the elections if, uh, in case of some humanitarian catastrophe in Belarus, where thousands of people die and nobody knows what to do. and. I don't see other possibilities. Okay. There were a couple of questions um, uh, about the handling of the um, pandemic, of course. Now, um, someone asked in the very beginning, what, I, what, I sh what shall I tell my um, partner living in Belarus who's very worried about the handling of the uh, pandemic? Um, and uh, also a follow-up question to this, uh, what should I tell her father who believes um, that their, a quote, fearless leader in Belarus is correct? So I'm not sure, I, I, I will bundle this with uh, another question. Maybe this is about the um, handling of the pandemic um, by 
another guest, I will just read it out, it's a little bit longer. There is now some evidence, both ethnographic um, and quantitative, that Belarusian population is practicing self-isolation and social distancing on the rate comparable, for instance, to Russian cities. Olga has mentioned the wave of civic initiatives in Belarus, which here in Minsk, so is a question from Minsk, looks really huge. This is probably not thanks to, but despite the state's policy. However, it might affect significantly the outcomes of pandemic for the country. So do you imagine that Belarus could come through the pandemic with not so bad statistics? When Lukashenko will use to, um, which Lukashenko then will use to legitimate his own decisions. I start. <laughs> I, I have to think of it. Um, as for the uh, two first questions, I think I'm not in, in, uh, in the position to give some, you know, some personal advices, but some general advices as of, uh, you know, um, evading, you know, some mass events and wearing medical masks uh, and uh, gloves if possible. I mean, some some general uh, uh, some advices of uh, uh, general wisdom. Uh, as for the as for the. Uh, uh, as for the uh, social distances, uh, distancing measures in Belarus, of course, the extents of of uh, these are not uh, comparable to the ones practicing in, in Russian cities, uh, because uh, yes, we can see from some available data that uh, that uh, the um, uh, rates uh, um, uh, the people. Uh, visits uh, uh, restaurants uh, or cafeteria decreased uh, at around 30 percent but uh, it, it's uh, uh, of course it's not enough to uh, to secure the um, uh, reproduction rates at uh, at uh, some low um, at some low point uh, to um, to considerably slow down the development of epidemics so I think that's uh, uh, because of largely, you know, the uh, social distances measures that the part of society is practicing, despite the uh, state uh, policies, uh, these rates uh, may be around 30 percent. This is my guess only. While in uh, while in in case of you know lo lockdown measures, uh, this uh, the reduction rates uh, can reach 90 percent and more. So um, again, we we are not uh, we are not talking about uh, uh, future predictions. This is just we are, we are discussing uh, potential scenarios. Uh, there are many unknown variables about how the epidemic uh, uh, may go and how how the this this virus works. But uh, as 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 we can see, the dynamic in, in other countries and uh, these an insufficient social distancing measures in Belarus, uh, uh, the um, pessimistic scenario when the uh, number of cases would uh, steadily grow and this upward trend would continue for the weeks to come is very real. Um, talking about the first question, what should you recommend? I completely agree with uh, I'm able we don't have the authority and, and the knowledge to recommend but I can just tell you what is actually uh, what is actually being officially at least officially recommended in Belarus because it's not it's not that nothing is being recommended so well elderly people should stay at home and should isolate themselves you can uh, even hear it uh, on television and there are certain volunteering uh, groups organized being organized for elderly people who uh, need to buy something uh, to, to go so that they do not have to go um, and, um, outside to buy uh, their food. So it, it's not that nothing is happening. There are also hotlines, there are information um, uh, telephone numbers being shown to the risk groups. Uh, just uh, one hour before our webinar, there was a live stream uh, from the Ministry of uh, Health of Belarus with the participation of a number of uh, specialists, the epidemiological specialists. And for the first time, actually, I saw that they were wearing mas masks on the cameras. So uh, people can actually inform themselves in Belarus about the, 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 the possible um, the recommended measures. It's just 
it, it comes in contradiction with the statements on the very high level. And that's, I think, uh, what is causing some kind of uh, discomfort among those people because they don't understand uh, whom um, to believe. Um, and uh, coming to the question, what is possible in terms of scenarios, um, uh, I mean, Nadia mentioned at the very beginning uh, the case of Sweden. I mean, we also do not have to um, forget that Belarus is not the only uh, country in Europe which has not introduced quarantine. So we still have Sweden there, the schools and kindergartens are open there. But Sweden is a very interesting case to um, compare with Belarus because the countries have more or less the same population with a bit more than 10 million in Sweden and uh, almost uh, 9.5 in Belarus. And they even have the same argumentation for not closing the schools, for example. If you close the schools, then the children will go to their parents or um, to their grandparents, which would belong to the risk groups, and then it would uh, damage their lives. So it's just the same argumentation in Belarus and in Sweden. But what is surprising is the reaction of society on that. Because we we'll see, according to polls in Sweden, over 70% of people actually approve this strategy while we see that about 50% of people in Belarus want to introduce the quarantine, about 20% of people want to uh, abolish public events. So it's the question of, it would be interesting case to compare it with, but we do not have to forget that the political culture and communication between society and government is very different in Belarus and Sweden. And um, the, the second point which is different is also who takes decisions. In Sweden, I think we already all know he, this, this biologist, his name is Segno, and he's actually in contact with the government in Sweden. So people believe, believe him because he's an expert in this field. In Belarus, people not always tend to believe the decisions because most of them understand that president takes uh, makes most of the decisions. But if we see the dynamic, uh, the, the death dynamic, it's uh, it's about, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Andrei, cor correct me, 10% um, death rate in Sweden. Uh, I mean, if I still have this, uh, just a second, if I have this file, uh, where do you have Let me just say it's 5 p.m., but if you all will bear with us, we can reserve another 10, 15 minutes for the questions. Uh, so we have this, uh, we have it, well, here. So look at that. Look, look, look how, 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 um, don't call how the case women uh, in English, dark. Uh, look how dark uh, it is in comparison to Belarus. So in Belarus, we have uh, under 1% um, mortality rate. So um, I don't know if, I think it's too early to compare because we don't really know if this mortality rate um, numbers or figures in Belarus are true because there is too much evidence about um, I'm in contact with human rights defenders. So there are there are cases in Belarus where people die from this two side pneumonia or however we call it in English, which is typical for COVID, but people are not being tested for COVID after they die before the death. Still relatives are being asked to bury these people in closed coffins and to stay 15 uh, days at home. And we don't see this figures in the statistics, so we don't know was it COVID, was not COVID. It's just too much speculation, I think, on that topic. It's too early now, and we'll have to wait. So um, we still have time, I think, um, to answer a, a couple of questions. Who are there's a strong interest in the uh, future. Uh, perspective and in the relation to other countries. So there are a couple of questions and uh, especially about uh, relations to the EU. Um, so um, maybe we could reserve the last uh, five to ten minutes to that and um, uh, get to that point. Let me have a look. Um, right. So. Um, do you think uh, that how Belarus is dealing with the pandemic will affect future relationships with other countries? Will it affect partnerships or cooperations uh, with Russia or the EU in any way? So there's Russia and the EU. That's a question from Marius. Um, how may the epidemic affect the Sino-Belarusian relations? You have to, um, we have to see whether you can 
get round to that as well. But especially in terms of EU-Belarus relations, what could the EU do? And in your views, what do the authorities expect and what do, and what do the Belarusian citizens uh, expect? Uh, that's a question from Evelina Schulz from the EEAS. Um, and I think the last question goes in a similar direction. Um, how do you see foreign relations with the EU, for example, after the lockdown will be mostly removed? So, and, a prob and that's probably, um, yes, that's probably a bundle of questions going the same direction. And I think we should close the uh, chat now because otherwise we, um, right, we are running out of time. Uh, I would start uh, by saying that uh, um, that Belarus uh, foreign relations uh, already strained uh, with a number of countries because of the way uh, the uh, the way Minsk deals with the epidemic. Uh, there was a spat between uh, Lithuanian president and uh, Lukashenko uh, about uh, the uh, epidemic because the Lithuanian side uh, criticized uh, uh, criticized uh, the way Belarus handles the epidemic, and uh, Lukashenko uh, responded uh, quite harshly, saying that uh, you know, um, saying to the Lithuanian president to mind uh, his own virus, right? Uh, also, the relations with Russia. Um, strains after uh, the Lukashenko statements and uh, a Belarus foreign minister interview, um, um, you know, amidst the pandemic. I, 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 I would remind that Lukashenko publicly criticized the quality of Russian uh, tests for coronavirus that's, uh, that were sent to Belarus uh, gratis. For, so uh, we can see that um, uh, it already has some implications uh, for the uh, relations, but uh, to some uh, limited extent. Of course, if the uh, situation aggravates and if uh, if uh, the Belarusian authorities continue uh, their um, you know um, policy insufficient measures, uh, then uh, it uh, can. Uh, totally lead to some uh, further uh, controversies in relations with uh, anyone, be it Russia or the European Union. And uh, I believe that uh, the European Union and other international players uh, have uh, um, some moral obligation, you know, to make an effort uh, at uh, Britain Minsk uh, on. Uh, facing the um, real threats of, of the uh, pandemic. Um, I, I think that uh, um, indeed uh, the insufficient measures can not only uh, result in some um, grave situation domestically, but can also totally harm uh, foreign relations uh, of uh, Belarus. Um, okay, Andre has already mentioned a lot of um, um, important points. I'll just um, um, give some um, concrete examples of what has actually happened till now in um, Belarus, um, Belarus and Russian relations. And uh, we, we really don't have a very good. I mean, I mean, it was not even it was not good before the pandemic. Uh, we had the whole history with uh, oil and, and, and gas wars, and the, the question, the eternal question of. Uh, integration uh, further integration and so on but now uh we have the situation that the whole world is in a kind of crisis it's pandemic uh, is a kind of um thing that unites people well it's a kind of a time to show people or maybe for one state to show other states that they are so sorry so, so solidarity and uh, it's exactly what is not happening between Belarus and Russia, although they are, have been talking about this further integration and about the union state. But what we actually see is um, middle of March, the, the borders were closed from Russia and the president was not even informed about that by the president Putin. And it was uh, uh, unexpected for the Belarusian president. Uh, then uh, the question of humanitarian aid is also very important because there were a large numbers of respirators, respirators I hope it's uh, okay in English, um, who should have been delivered from Russia, but then it was not possible because of the border closure. 
then we saw that uh, people were ha having problems, people from Belarus with Belarusian passport to come with uh, Russian airlines back to Belarus. So, and all kind of media wars that even the Belarusian president is talking about now that the Russian media are showing um, the, the Belarus uh, that kind of humanitarian crisis is starting in Belarus, that the president does not have um, uh, the, the virus under control. So I don't see actually any positive sentences now in Belarus-Russian relations. And then coming to the EU, um, well, I think the, 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 the only possible and past uh, fast aid that is uh, wished by all states now is of course either humanitarian aid or uh, financial aid in this crisis and that's what uh, already happened because we know that Belarus also receives a certain number um, in certain figure, I don't remember, I think it's 60 million um, uh, if I'm not mistaken um, from the European Union uh, because it's part of the Eastern Partnership and uh, in spite of the money, maybe just to show support for people, because um, I mean, when you're talking about something like human rights or political freedoms, for most of people in Belarus is something which does not really have to do um, anything with their real life. But now people see that this virus actually affects their real life. They see their relatives dying or they see their colleagues who are sick, and this could be, I think, a good possibility for the states and for the European Union to show solidarity, to show support, and actually to, to explain people, to people why they also need uh, good relations, so to say, not only with the Eastern neighbors. So I think financial help and showing solidarity and humanitarian aid, which is already happening, is a good tendency, and uh, um, uh, it should be also. Uh, uh, taking Nadia, what do you think in terms of time? Maybe last last question from the audience, and then we have uh, a couple of minutes for final statements. I would say. Okay. Um, there is a you to select. <laughs> one of the last questions uh, um, by Elena Denisova Schmidt. Uh, what Germans? Uh, what can Germans NGOs do to help? For example, buying equipment for hospitals, protective material. Do you have any recommendations? And all, yes, if, and also maybe uh, another uh, second one. Um, uh, Dmitry Bondarenko, the coordinator of European Belarus, even suggested the idea of a coup d'etat because the president has proven to be inadequate and poses a threat to everybody. What do you think about the statement? Um, maybe those two. Could you repeat the statement? Um, that there was the idea of a coup d'etat because of the handling of the uh, pandemic uh, and because it was inadequate. What do you think about the statement by Dmitry Bondarenko? On the first question, uh, uh, thank you for bringing this. Uh, uh, sure, if there's a uh, uh, possibility to uh, to provide uh, some assistance, uh, then uh, there's a uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, dot by um, initiative, uh, which, uh, which collects. Maybe we can post it somewhere. Yeah, by, by, by COVID-19, yeah, initiative which collects the needs uh, from the uh, Belarusian hospitals and uh, uh, do their best to, you know, to find the necessary equipment and uh, to uh, to provide them more. So, uh, as um, uh, indeed there's a deficit of uh, some items and uh, protective uh, equipment in Belarus, um, any chance of um, supplies from foreign countries is uh, much needed and appreciated. Uh, and as for the question on uh, 
um, coup d'etat. Uh, as, as I previously said, um, in case the uh, epidemiological situation goes, after, uh, goes out of control, uh, then uh, and uh, the socioeconomic uh, situation uh, is uh, becomes uh, much worse. Then, of course, it uh, would bring uh, uncertainty to uh, domestic political situation. So it uh, it's may uh, lead to some uh, um, some events uh, unthinkable uh, a year or two ago. So uh, it all depends on the. Uh, on the uh, house uh, on the situations uh, uh, developments in the next weeks and months um i completely agree with andre on the second question so i don't think i have to to add here something and on the first question of what german ngos uh, could do um to help um well it more or less would depend on the on the the nature of ngos what capacities they have and what are their specialization but uh, i would also agree with andre this is uh, an initiative you can find it on the internet and social media under hashtag by covid19 so uh, but they also have a website um but they have already started to, to work for example with belarus and diaspora in abroad so they're already gathering money also outside from belarus um and they are trying also to organize the um not the production but the transport of the the needed equipment also from the european countries from the eu countries so uh, if somebody is wishing to help these initiatives, I think it would make sense just to contact them um, directly. And um, just another um, important point, um, um, it could be possible, as I already mentioned before, that in case of a very bad scenarios that people, uh, quite a lot of people lose their jobs, that the economic crisis and humanitarian crisis um, will uh, be seen in Belarus, that could of course uh, there could be some uh, political repressions, um, uh, especially uh, towards um, independent journalists who write about the figures and uh, bloggers, uh, also human rights defenders. So, um, in, 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 a, in case of that scenario, it could come to a uh, certain kind of uh, repression. So those organizations in Germany and also in other countries who already have some partnerships or you know, organizations working in this area in Belarus, it would make sense just to exchange information and in order to see how the situation is um, developing. But um, once again, we're speculating nowadays because we don't know if it's really under control or if the figures are being falsified, we cannot tell it for now. Okay, I believe we have to come to an end here. Unless you have uh, some final remarks, Andre, Olga? I don't. No, okay. Um, yes, uh, special thanks to you both. Um, I found it uh, very interesting and also it's very important, I think, that you both underlined that uh, you outlined only trends and scenarios and you did not make any predictions. That's uh, probably an important point to make. So special thanks to Olga and Andre and uh, to the audience for joining us today. Um, and we hope to be with you with another webinar soon again. So stay uh, safe <laughs> and sane, also mentally. Yes, and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.